Welcome to Lost in Criterion. This week we're talking about 1957 Ingrid Bergman's directorial masterpiece. No. Yeah, I... Seventh Seal. It is. It is the movie that kicked off the American art house movement. Really, uh, there were a few stragglers earlier on, some Fellini that made it over. Um, I don't think the stragglers really, really come first, Adam. Well, I yes, you're right. You're absolutely right. They're they're what. Pragglers, pro stragglers. I, I, I don't know. Um, ahead to, of their time. Uh, to coin a, they were no, they were ahead of their time. This is this is one of the first movies that sort of introduced the idea to American hipsterati that one can stay up all night talking about a movie, <laughs> <laughs> and that is an acceptable acceptable thing to do. So this movie, this movie existing, is the reason Pat and I are doing what we do now. Literally, um, yeah. This is. Yeah, literally. This without this the movie, reason Criterion Collection exists. Yeah, without this movie, and yet it's the eleventh film in the list. Yeah, that's okay. Some of the movies before it were better. Yes, some sure. of them were much worse, and a lot of the movies coming after it, I would rather watch this than ever watch again. Yes, and we've still got to go watch those. Hello, Armageddon. Yes, man, that is going to be. What number is that? I can't remember. I it's, it's within the first fifty, though. It's ter- it's, it's, it's close. Terrifying. It's pretty close. Yeah. Um. Anyway, uh, since we didn't do this yet, I am Adam Glass, mm-hmm. and this is my partner, John Patrick Owitari Dorgan. <laughs> I like I like how long we pause between that. We should we could time that better. I could probably just cut out the break when I actually edit no. this, but I'm there not going no to. No editing in this at all. No. No. What's, what's going to happen is I'm going to find our first interactive conversation piece. I'm going to line that up, and I'm just going to hope the rest of it lines up. <laughs> it's gonna be, yeah, by the end of it, it's going to be a mess. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, of course I'm not going to do that. But I haven't started editing these yet. We are, we are just housekeeping. I think I mentioned this a few, few episodes earlier. We're kind of getting a head start on these. So these aren't being recorded as they're being played for you. Obviously, wait, it's, not wait, it's not live. I don't think so you're an idiot. So, of course, it was pre-recorded. But we're actually we're pre-recording. We're getting a little bit of a head start like pre-recording quite a these. Large amount of time. Probably. A few months. A few months. Probably. We haven't really decided when we're going to live with this yet. But we're going to try and get maybe, a pretty good back. We never will. Maybe you're not even hearing this right now. <laughs> maybe we're doing this completely uselessly for our own entertainment. Eh, good enough. Which is fine by me. Anyway, the seventh seal. Um, <laughs> I want to know what happened to uh, seal one through six. Oh, um, well, it's I, mean, I could actually get into this if you wanted me to. No, it's, please it's don't. A, a, it's a reference to Revelation, right? Which I've uh, never read. The so. last book of the Bible. Um, well, oh, you're a sinner, aren't you? Mm-hmm. And and, uh, and many other things. Sodomite. Oh, it's okay. I've 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 never read I've never read Revelation itself, but I did read uh, all of the Left Behind books, so I'm pretty sure I <laughs> which know what is practically happens. the same thing. Yeah, I've seen the one with Kirk um, Cameron, the movie. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. If you've seen the if you've seen the movie with Kirk Cameron, I think you, you know everything about. If you've Revelation. seen anything with Kirk Cameron, if you've seen anything with Kirk Cameron, I think you're pretty good <laughs> on what Revelation has to say about the apocalypse. <laughs> All right, and we're already off topic. <laughs> and we're, we're off. I think we're no, we're, we're setting it's a new fine record to be this one. Nah, it's it's not a new record. We. We we were certainly this off topic, even even recently with hard boiled. I think true. we were this off topic. I think we were off topic off. before we started the podcast on that one. So yes, and I'm sure as as we have joked about, the Armageddon one will be just as off topic. I can't wait. I'm so excited. Can't wait. Can't wait to talk about Armageddon. Yep. Don't want to miss a thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> Seventh Seal. Um, it is. It is. It is a movie about death. It is an off-parodied and homaged movie. Uh, even Animaniacs had an episode devoted to a parody of. <laughs> yes, they did. Great. Here's the thing, though. 
it is a movie about death that I actually enjoy. And oh, the, yeah. And I want to explain this, okay? Because I have often ranted about the fact, as I'm sure you are aware of, of the, the, the film's final destination. Yes. Okay? My primary problem with those films is that they are a film in who... In, they are films in which the protagonist is death. Antagonist. Okay. Or the the, the antagonist. Oh yes, yeah, sorry. Death. Antagonist. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Yes, I'm sorry. A, antagonist is death. But which I find normally find atrocious. Yeah. Because basically what they have done is removed any character in well, that role. Like death has no meaning in it. But in this one we well, actually have death as as well, a character. Yeah. And I find it no, that's that's the problem with those movies isn't that the bad guy is death, it's that the bad guy isn't fa- death yeah. personified. Well what what I'm saying is it made me realize that I need to yeah. be more clear yeah. on my complaints yes. about Final yes. Destination. Which comes up all yes. <laughs> No, I'm sure it does. That, the, <laughs> that I need to be more clear that it's not the problem that death is the is the villain, it's that death is the villain with absolutely no yeah. person. In this we have we have a personification of death, and he's he's almost he is as silly as he is menacing in some ways. You know what? He is my favorite character. Oh, absolutely, himself. absolutely. Well, I don't know. I mean, he. Well, you get the impression when he's not supposed to be the one that is your favorite oh, of course to watch. Not. No, I, you're like, right. I think there. Joff is Joff, probably, Joff is on there. Joff and um, then... John's the, the the squire is certainly supposed. Yeah, supposed to be up there. There, there are there are more easily re- relatable characters, though you know everybody's relatable in their own way because everybody's going through this this different aspects of this human struggle. Joff, Joff, to his credit, I think the reason he's more of the protagonist than anyone else in the movie, and certainly the the audience stand-in for the entire thing, is that he's not he's not letting the struggle get him down. Everybody else is very intent in the struggle, even the very the yeah, very please. agnostic. John's the squire is is still you know he's he's worried about it he's intellectually worried well yeah he's 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 uh Joff is the only character who is not preoccupied yeah with and and his wife and his son obviously but well, right but they're extensions yeah, but they're, of him. basically in this film they are an extension yeah. of him that family unit I mean, which is which is why it's is, great that they are him why it's great that they're the only ones to survive <laughs> For, for the time, because they are still in a plague-ridden country. <laughs> they are also human, which means they all... Well, I'm, I'm not so sure that these characters yeah, ever mean... die, Pat. That's what I'm saying. Okay, no. okay. No, uh, they may be live forever. Yeah, they keep dodging death. But death, death in this movie, um, our, our main character, the knight, whose name I can't remember offhand. Um, Ooh. You got that written down? I have no idea. Um, to Wikipedia. You can do that real quick. Your keyboard's quieter than mine is. Uh, the, yeah, I'll, I'll start the knight, that. Cause... The knight challenges death to a game of chess. Uh, and obviously this scene gets parodied a lot, even just in the challenge. The, the whole movie takes place over the course of this game. Um, uh, whereas most parodies kind of uh, condense it into, into one thing. Bill and Ted's excellent adventure. Um, or Bogus Journey. I said. No, it was excellent. It was Bogus Journeys. It was the second Bill and Ted movie. Um, where they played death in a series of, of games, including Battleship and Sorry, I believe. Um, a lot of a lot of Hasbro <laughs> in there. Oh, why isn't that in the Criterion Collection? Ah, it's a classic of world cinema. <laughs> anyway, um... Now I get, I've distracted myself. So he challenges death to chess as a sort of chance at reprieve of death. Antonius Block. Antonius Block, yes. Yes, our knight. Knight Antonius Block. Um, challenges death to a game of chess, thinking himself quite good at chess and knowing, since he has seen paintings of death playing chess, uh, knowing that death likes chess. And that's this actually, that painting is a painting that exists in a church uh, in, I think, Hungary. Uh, some of the background material I was reading. And that's what inspired Bergman to, to make the movie. Um, was a lot of classical um, medieval painting. More than medieval history, obviously. There's 
a bit of anachronism in this movie, and it's by no means a historical movie. No, it is, no. If you're going in for history, yeah, we are telling we are telling a story in in a sort of mythical history. Um, well, we're yeah, but, we're st- we're telling yeah. a story in in what you get for the Middle Ages yeah. in most storytelling. Yeah, yeah you know exactly. I mean? it's, it's the idealized mythical medieval era. Yeah. Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> anyway, um, so he challenges him chess, and ain't that wonderful. And uh, death accepts. I, though, uh, you know, pretty, pretty clear that there's no way this guy can win against death. Death still accepts. And it, there's, there's a lot of great little... I mean, it's a very dark movie, obviously, because it's dealing with death. But there's a lot of great humor in it. And, you know, you got to have humor in the face of death. Um, it's, it's a common human reaction to things. But it's very it's a very funny movie at times. It is, yeah. actually. It's, it's, it's more than just, like, humor in the face of death, yeah. though. It is actually legitimately oh, an amusing yeah. movie. Yeah. And there's, like, the writing is pretty good about that. There's a, there's, a great, there's a great little joke at the beginning where deciding who goes first, uh, Block holds up a pawn of each color in his hand and Death chooses um, and Death chooses the black pawn and, and Block says you chose black and Death says very appropriate don't you think? Yeah it, it, <laughs> yeah it's very it's it's that's why I say yeah. it, like Death is my favorite oh, yeah. character Death. In the film he's there's this wry humor about yeah. him where you can't really interpret him as a bad guy yeah like, which is, which is what makes the film, well, in my mind, one of the things that makes the film so interesting is the fact that he is the bad guy to all of them. Yeah. But he is not a bad yeah. guy. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's, that's death. He is their enemy, and yet he is yeah. not their enemy. Death. He is not doing this from, from out. It is. He is death. He, it's his job. It's it's what he does. Yes, it li- well, and, it, and it, it's a thing that must. Yeah, happen. it's a thing that must. Like, happen. You know, he's just a very amusing character yeah. in my just, mind. I, and the, he, they establish it very early. Well, even the way he agrees to chess. Yeah. Like he he does it in this sort of like way that says, "Well, if you want to, I mean, it's no skin off my yeah. back." Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. Like he's like, yeah, we can waste a little time. <laughs> yeah. He says, uh, "Block says, wait a minute," and and Death says, "They all say that. I grant no reprieves." Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, they, and they they start their game, and the game continues throughout the movie um, until the very last scene, where where you know, we're, and we'll get to that, where death death tells him that he'll be in checkmate in the next move, and then leaps and promises that when he comes back, he's taking them all with them. Um, but in the meantime, Block wants his reprieve because. He wants proof of God's existence, or at the very least of Satan's existence, uh, to prove to himself that there is something greater than the despair of humanity that he's seen. Um, and death death offers no answers in that regard. Um, which is great, too, in its own way. I mean, this is very... This is very philosophically straightforward, because it's things that everybody goes through but but the death here, despite being a personification of death, is still just death. Death offers no answers yeah, because death can't can't bring anything back. Um, he's just there. Yeah, he, he is. A, he is a, basically a literal personification yeah. of a force. Yeah. Rather than like what we get a lot of times in other uh, fiction along these lines, where death is something more. Yeah. This death is just a kind of yeah, just a personification of a thing that happens. Yeah, yeah, and and in that regard, death is like I said at the same time menacing and um, and funny. Like when when the leader of the acting troupe dies, he's in the forest and he's climbed a tree to avoid being eaten by a bear explicitly, and then death walks up, pulls out a big uh, hacksaw and starts cutting down the tree. Oh, and that is so ridiculous. Yeah. It's a ridiculous moment. And, you know, and death is sometimes ridiculous. 
a man climbing a tree to avoid being killed by a bear ends up in a tree that's cut down. That is that is the basis of every uh, Darwin Award. <laughs> Basically. Yeah. Um, oh, and our, and, our, and our acting troop member is certainly a qualifying member oh, of, the, yes. of the Darwin Awards. He is a moron. Yeah. Yeah, he's a moron. But it's great. It's great. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so throughout the movie, Block is traveling around looking for his answers, um, while his squire, the poncho to his, uh, to his Don Quixote, um, you know, because they, they, they're very, these guys are tropes. It's, it's a quest movie, and it's the, the you know, upright knight trying to do good, and is more down-to-earth squire who really understands what's going on. Um, it's not doing a lot new. Those are those are tropes that have existed no, since, that's very, since very ancient, ro- <laughs> ancient roman- <laughs> I romances. Mean, well, one of the things in my one of my notes is uh it's it's like a really per- it's like a really morbid Canterbury tale. Yeah. It's it's it, just as much it, that. But it's fine because that's not the point of the film anyway. Yeah. Yeah. No. Well, certainly. So, um Block has he actually has two intentions. One, he wants to draw this out as long as he can to try and get answers before before he faces the ultimacy of death. Um, but at the same time, he wants to do one good, certifiably good act before yeah, he dies. Yeah, he wants... It's really, in that way, kind of a really nice yeah. film in that way, too. He is, his goal is to do something after having basically committed whole scale slaughter yeah. he wants to in the name of what he thought was good yeah. he is trying to redeem himself with one decent yeah. purely positive action there's a, there's a great moment when, yeah. when he presents this death has disguised himself as a priest and uh, Block has entered the church um, and he he views the crucifix, and he almost goes to pray, but then doesn't, and just goes to the confessional. And death as the priest is there, and he talks about, you know, what, what he wants to achieve from his fight against death. But he also talks about his actual strategy in it. And he yeah. he says, you know, he, he, he says that he's going to use, you know... Uh, a combination of the bishop and the knight. And, and you know, no man in our movie, more than Block, knows what happens when you... Use a combination of a bishop <laughs> yes, and a knight? Combine, combine religion and military force. He's just come back from the Crusades. And it's an atrocity, as far as he's concerned. And as far as, you know, his is concerned, too. Um... But there's, and, and still in that moment, there's a great piece of humor because he, he presents his plan because he's confessing to a priest and, and death turns around and reveals himself and says, I'll remember that. Yeah, yeah, but, it's, a, it's a really amusing moment. Yeah. It is, this, this movie is simultaneously amusing and poignant in everything it does. And that's, I mean, that's why you can stay up all night talking about this movie. Um, well, yeah, that's why it's kicked yeah. off the art house movement, yeah. basically. It's, yeah. <laughs> it, 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 unfortunately, that also presents us with a problem in that we've got to talk about it in an hour. Not, well, it's not a lot that I find that it is a great movie, and I really enjoyed it. And it was, it's maybe not quite at the level of four hundred blows for me because that's yeah. still my favorite movie we have watched, and possibly my favorite movie ever. Yeah. But this was—it's so good. There's not a lot to talk about. I find. <laughs> A little bit. Maybe. When I Maybe. was thinking about it while I was watching, I was like, there's not... So much of my life is based on complaints. Yeah. <laughs> there's not a lot to complain about. Well, time. yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's it, one it, problem. It very much achieves the goal that it set out to achieve. No one... And that's it. No one you know wants I mean? to... Uh, no one wants to listen it. to us sing praise of a movie. Uh, exactly. Yeah. We have to find something to complain about this film. And you know what I'm going to complain about? <laughs> is what you brought up before we started recording. 
How is Antonius Block, the actor who plays that, only 27 years old? Yes, the actor who plays the knight is 27 Man, looks years old. 80. He, he, he looks, well, I mean, and that's why he's perfect casting for this. He is a man who oh, is, yeah. who is weary beyond his years. Because, um, well, like, you know, I mean, maybe not 80, but he looks easily pushing his, his 40s, 50s. Midlife. Yeah. yeah. Which might as well be 80s in, yeah. you know, whatever year this is supposed to be set at. Yeah. Really. But I mean, like he, it's it's amazing. So, well, let's let's. Uh, there's a lot of there's <laughs> a lot of interesting like, good things that the movie does. Um, I really love how they change um, change our perspective. Um, like we're following we're following the knight and the squire up from the beach at the very beginning. Um, this beach, and the use of the coast is is a great image. It's, it's just sort of because we start on the coast looking at the sea. And it's just yeah. like the world is being created as we, out of out of this nothingness of the sea rises the land and the night and our story, um, and we end on the coast too, um, not quite directly, but we end on the cliffs above the coast. Um, yeah. But uh, but we're following the night, and you know we get our first image of the skull when the squire goes to ask this shepherd or whatever. Um, about where the inn is and discovers that the, the it is just a dead body with sunken eyes and no more skin um, plague ridden there's a great there's a great little you know oh, yeah I love what the squire says about it yes he was he was quite elegant but what he said was very depressing um, yeah it was it, it's a great line yeah, like it's a great and line. really kind of establishes the squire as Irreverent. It's, yes. it's nice. It's good. Yeah, it does yeah. a great job. In yes. the first scene, we already know the personality of yeah. the squire. Yeah, and, and yeah, in one in one small conversation, we get his entire personality, which is a very irreverent agnosticism. Not really atheism, but it's not agnosticism. Um. Yeah, and he's set up as this intellectual. He says later, and it's, it's really great when he's talking to the uh, the. Uh, Prog or Porg or whatever the uh, the smithy the painter or oh the blacksmith the blacksmith um, he and and the guy he he says to John he says do you even do you even believe what you're telling me and and John says of course not I never said I believed it but I'm a I'm a <laughs> learned man ask me for a piece of advice I'll give you two um, <laughs> It's such a great moment. It's, it's a really, he's a great character. But, um, anyway, what I was at was we go from that scene and we follow them riding through the countryside a little bit and they pass the actor's uh, cart, the, the wagon that they're in, and, you know, we just stop following the knight and we go and we zoom in on the, on the actor. And almost all of the segues are like that. I mean, we don't just cut to something. We visually segue. Yeah, we it. hand off. Yeah, we hand off things, um, and then we are introduced to Joff and his wife and their boss and the baby. And Joff sees the Virgin Mary in a vision, and we learn that he has a lot of religious sorts of visions. <laughs> he has, he has a lot of also a lot of apparently quote unquote visions. Yes, which are just him lying. Yes, yes, indeed. His his wife doesn't believe in any of them, but he sees the Virgin playing with the. Christ child, and it's very weird that uh, when he recounts this to his wife, I think, I, th- I found it interesting, uh, though I'm not entirely sure why, even, um, when he recounts this to his wife and, and says that he saw the virgin, but he never mentions the baby. Um, he, never yeah. saw, he never saw the virgin and Christ, he just saw the, vir- <laughs> the virgin, and it's, it's, it's weird. But at the same time, it's, it's very clear in that and in... You know, we've already seen some things where this is even more clear. But obviously, the ch- I mentioned the chess with death came from a painting. Um, a lot of the imagery in this movie is just pulled straight from medieval paintings. Um, and we meet we meet a few painters and obviously a lot of entertainers in this movie as well. But it's very that is if there is any clear influence on this, it is the art of the period more than the period itself. But the Virgin Mary mm-hmm. that he sees is not is in no way any sort of traditional woman in a blue robe sort of thing. 
that we see no, in most she's, divinities. Cr- she's crowned and yeah. jeweled, and she is she is Queen Mary, Mary Queen of Heaven, I suppose. Yeah, is is how Dante describes her, and that's the sort of the sort of image we get here of her. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of he wears his influences on his sleeves, <laughs> really. It's in a way this movie is a pastiche. Uh, a tapestry of of other things of tapestries. Yes, yeah, a tapestry of tapestries. Um, but but that's you know it's really interesting though because like it is that but it's it really actually makes the movie stronger. Oh, yeah. in my opinion, just because you you can see that this is not an accurate representation of the period very clearly and very easily, but rather a representation of the fantasy of the period. Yeah, like, yeah. this is what. This is how they saw themselves because I mean, yeah. yeah, you you see these things that are taken straight from the paintings and tapestries yeah. that are not realistic. Yeah. They're not what was happening, but it is what the fantasy of the time was. But not just the fantasies, also the fears. Yeah, exactly. You get the entire sort of yeah. well, yeah, the fantastical yeah. imagery of the time. Yeah, and and we we get the inner, yeah. <laughs> Oh, there's just so many great lines, and I, I've quoted a lot of them in my notes. Like when he's talking to the priest, you know, he says, "In our fear, we make an idol and call it God." Um, just his his worry that there is no afterlife, that he's just cr- we've just created this idea of God for comfort. Um, you know, it's also it's obviously a very postmodern nihilistic view of things, but it's still it's him searching, and and at the same time, Block is the only character. I mean, not the only character, but obviously Joff is in there too. But he's he's one of the few characters, despite his fear and his questions, he still holds on to his religion. At the very end, when death has come for the whole lot of them, um, after you know they're they're at they're at uh, Block's house. Um, everyone else, you know, Block's wife is very accepting of death. You know, she's kind of establishes that because, you know, she's sat around at the house risking the plague, waiting for him to come back. Right, for the last yeah. ten years. The maid who uh, the squire saved from from uh, the fellow trying to rape her um, and then, you know, pulls her, pulls her along with him. Um, uh, she's very accepting of death, but she's had... She's... she's- more than accepting. Yeah, she's, she is. She's begging for it. She's, I mean, it's like yeah. the first word she say, and she says, are, are accepting death at the very end. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, they, they're both there and accepting. Uh, and the squire just, you know, says, try to have one last moment of triumph um a man should feel immense uh, the immense triumph of his final moments when you can still roll your eyes and wiggle your toes as Block is breaking down begging God for mercy in prayer at the very last moments as death takes them and it's it's it's, it's a really weird thing I want to I want to mention because it's kind of hard to notice um but the two characters there who are the most accepting of death, the ones absolutely, you know, waiting for it, really. Um, and that's that's the maid and Block's wife aren't part of the dance at the end. Um, oh, interesting. When the char- yeah, when the characters are let off, we've got, you know, everyone who died in that final sequence, but not those two. Um, Block is there, and... and the squire's there, and the woodworker's there, the, the smith is there, and the smith's wife is there, um, but not those two. They're not they're not part of the dance macabre, because maybe, I guess, they weren't fighting it, and that's enough of a reason. It's... Well, if you, take, if you take the dance at the end as an analogy for the struggle against death, yeah. the people who don't struggle against death never dance the dance of death. Yeah, they just they don't need live to. and die. They just live and die, and then they go. Whereas the people who fight it are dancing. Yeah. So. 
Yeah. It makes sense. Although, at the same time, I do find that I don't feel like the squire is against it. You get kind of from the very beginning, the squire has given up. He's... That, like, he knows it's coming and is not prepared in the same way as the other people. Because the other people are so, like, the other, the two women are very, like... Yeah. They're, they're like, begging that. for it. But he, he is... Obviously, almost from the moment we see him, no longer cares. He understands he is, the absurdity he, he's of it. He's ambivalent. Yeah. He's, I don't think he's ambivalent he, he to death. He doesn't want to die, but... He loves life, but he understands right. the absurdity of life. Right. He would but rather he's, not he's die. He's got that sort of hedonistic sort of, yeah. I'm going to enjoy this because I know it won't last. And I, yeah. at the same time, I feel like following the analogy of... Those who fight it are the ones who dance the dance macabre, and those who yeah. don't are the ones who don't, right? But yeah. he doesn't fight it, per se. He just rolls along, you know what I mean? He's like, well, I'm going to enjoy it while I'm here, and then he, yeah. don't, he doesn't fight. Like, Antonius fights it at the end. He yeah. attempts, he turns to his religion and, you know, begs for mercy, right? But the squire is like, well, enjoy the last second, guys. So I don't, I don't know if it, at that point maybe our analogy of the dance macabre at the end falls apart a little bit because I don't feel like he danced the dance macabre. He just, it's like he more like know. he watched from the sidelines. He's a a wallflower maybe. in the dance macabre. I I don't know. I I still feel like, you know, even accepting as as the finalities as he is, that doesn't mean he actively seeks them. That's true. I guess, I mean, he he hasn't embraced death. He's just yeah. accepted that it is a certainty that he's not going to fight. Yeah. I don't know. It's complicated in the fact that, like, I'm not sure about the concept. Because, like, the two women at the end seem to have embraced it. But that alone is the most depressing thing in the world. Yeah. No, that is... <laughs> like, 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 the squire's attitude is at least somewhat reasonable in that he understands. He has made amends of the fact that, like, this is going to happen. Whereas they are actively seeking it. Um, you can almost see it, especially in the the maid who gets rescued. She sees death and is just delighted by the fact that it's over. Yeah. And that alone is a depressing thing to think about. No, but it certainly. fits with the time period, I suppose. If you have lived with death surrounding you at all times, it mm. kind of can be seen as relief. So, yeah, I don't know. It's it's a weird. If your if your choices are are death or almost daily rape uh, in a plague infested uh, nightmare world, yeah, nightmare world. So. Uh, maybe death is maybe a death. welcome option. There's certainly people. There's certainly people who would welcome death. Um, and yeah, to that and, and uh, there were certainly people who did. It's just yeah. you know, it's just really, it it. I for one have a little bit of trouble making the that final. Now that you point, I did. I missed that, but making that final dance. Yeah. Even out one hundred percent with the way I interpreted the characters. Yeah. So. Hey. But also again, um, what is it? Joff is also hallucinate so <laughs> yeah maybe it's not and <laughs> that's knows? that's the other thing maybe you know joff john maybe the wife's not there because joff never met the wife and this is just his hallucination so why should she be there he doesn't know she exists and the maid is there because she never made an impression on joff they never really interacted because she never right, talked exactly he's only so, seeing yeah. the people he knows yeah he's seeing the people he knows the people he interacted with so, you know, at the same time, maybe that's it. Maybe maybe it means nothing, and it just means that we're seeing Joff's perspective, and Joff's dreaming again, and this isn't really happening, and Joff's crazy. And even, <laughs> even if even if Joff isn't crazy, they're also not relevant characters. <laughs> they're, yeah. they're also not very important. Like, uh, we, we get the lady, we get the maid is basically there just to show us how awful things are. Yeah. And the wife is there to show us... I, you know, 
I don't even know. Well, uh, she... <laughs> wife is there. She does... Uh, she she pulls in one... You know, there's the recurring... The recurring symbolism of looking into a face. And... and um, she reminds Block of his humanity, I think is what... Okay, why, yeah. Why she's really there. Because Block has described... About... Yeah, he's described his face as empty, like his, like his heart, earlier. And she reminds him that the only way she knows... Um, that it's him is by looking into his face and seeing mm-hmm. seeing what's still there. Um, yeah. So, so you I mean, know, she she she, well, she serves a narrative ser- point. Go ahead. She serves a narrative point in that, um, and and obviously she she pulls that symbolism there too. But I think I think in a way it's the wife's fault that Block at the end still. Holds to his religion, even even in the last moments. I think. I mean, obviously, she was vaguely religious. She's the one who reads Revelation, the the verses. The movie takes and, the title. And supper from. time reading. Yeah, the supper time, the great supper time reading of of Revelation. It's weird. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean obviously, it's, the, the it's thematically symbolism within the movie. But thematically weird. appropriate, but. Not something I feel that anyone would logically actually do. Um, yeah. If for no other reason than be illegal for her to own a Bible. <laughs> well, there you go. Yay, historical accuracy. Um, but, yeah. Um, Antonius, throughout the entire movie, interrogates pretty much anyone he can um, about the nature of death. Um, so when they meet that witch, um, everyone says that she's evil and she's had relations with the devil, uh, so they're going to burn her. Uh, he, he questions her and wants to know whether or not she's she's uh, actually seen the devil, because if she has actually seen the devil, that'll be proof enough that there's something greater, something beyond humanity that, that he can hold on to, because the devil proves God to an extent. Um... Or at least with his religion, there are there are religions that have the devil and no God. They're weird ones. Well, but <laughs> it, yeah, I mean he's but, but as far as he's concerned, and, and yeah, yeah, he he takes devil. I mean, it's not a huge logical yeah. leap for him to go yeah, through. Exactly. So he and again we we get a moment where he looks into her eyes uh, as she's saying, "Can't you see him? He's all around." Um, and, and, he looks into her eyes and sees that same nothingness that he feels and knows that she's just mad. Crazy. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, driven mad by, you know, whether or not she was crazy beforehand. She cer- cer- yeah, certainly, certainly now she's... tortured her enough yeah. to make her crazy. She's reflecting the ideas of, of the soldiers and the monks who have punished her that she is in, cohort- in cohorts with the devil. And he is always near her, holding her hand and pulling her along. Um, which is why they break her hands, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> but, Weird. Yeah, very... Uh, that character is very depressing. Because she's, uh, she's obviously meant to be... And they refer to her as a child at some points. And she's obviously meant to be young, but... they They put her through the ringer, don't they? Yeah, and I, that's one of those moments in the film when they go through that a couple of times, because she follows them for quite some time. Like, we encounter her multiple times. Yeah, uh, the, the it's, procession it's, of them going to burn her follow, uh, meets up with them when they're in the woods. Yeah, and she's interesting just because she kind of goes towards that, proving that sort of futility thing that we get into throughout the film at times about like kind of almost kind of proving the points of the, the, the squire makes like I mean like there's this woman who is being basically tortured for no reason yeah and like obviously if you're dealing with it from a historical accuracy standpoint she isn't being tortured for no reason but because the film in a sort of wink wink nudge nudge way especially through the squire acknowledges that the that the watchers are not of this time period makes it clear that this is pointless you know yeah. am i making sense i don't know if i'm making sense but 
yeah, basically, like, the film through the Squire, I especially feel through the Squire, but also through death a little bit, acknowledges that the viewers are not actively part of this culture, right? And so they see this as pointless, and they they go out of their way to show that this this murderer, this torture and murder of this woman is pointless and meaningless. Yeah. And terrible. Yeah. So. There's a lot of terrible people in this movie. There are, but I mean, it's just that one's really striking because even the way that Squire talks about her, but also like the way that uh, even Antonius talks about her with this total, like, they're almost outside. That we, yeah. we at that point we get to see that they are not a part of this culture either. Yeah, and because that's, everybody else in the movie is convinced that she's a witch. Well, not everybody yeah. else, but every all the side characters who are going to burn her are yeah. adamant that she's a witch. But these two characters who are basically set up as just as much outsiders as we are. Yeah, when dealing with this, the madness of their own home. Yeah. Yeah, and you know it's 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 established that they're doing this. They've convinced themselves that she's caused the plague, and just like right. the people whipping themselves, this is them trying to get back in God's good graces. Um, and you know that's that's really the point of the whole seventh seal thing is heaven. Heaven is silent for this half hour. Um, this age, God isn't speaking to anyone, um, and God isn't answering any of their questions. And God isn't responding as they call out to God. Um, that's the very nihilistic portion of this movie. But, um, but at the same time, she's convinced by it just as much. And that's really, really weird. And that's why John's... Uh, John, he doesn't save her. The squire doesn't. You know, he right, says, because there's nothing to save. Yeah, yeah he says he, he considered killing all the soldiers. But then he looked at her, and he saw in her eyes, he, he knew there was nothing left to say. She was his daughter. Yeah, and, and that's... But at that same time, both John's and Antonius's the way they regard her is not, in my mind, ac- is not meant to be accurate to what the way people would react at that time. Yeah. It's meant to... No. It's, You're absolutely it's right. meant to show us the way we're supposed to react to her. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, yeah, she was weird. Yeah, but you know, um, it's a weird movie. Yeah, I mean, no, for, God, so for we, goodness' we sake, there's a guy playing chess with the devil, or not the devil. Sorry, with death. A guy I, playing a devil who looks like Dwight D. Eisenhower. We might ask. Yes, I and is like apparently like eight feet tall from the way they shoot this film. Yes, yes. No, it's wonderful. He's, he's great. He's very, I just wish he's it was, very I wish imposing it, death. I think we should remake the film exactly, scene for scene, but replace the chess with dueling banjos. <laughs> what do you think? Um, if it hasn't already well, been Well, uh, it kind of has. The devil went down to Georgia. Right, I understand that, but what I'm saying is yeah. that's not a film. <laughs> You're right. I think there might have been a movie version of that, though. Really? If there hasn't, there should have been. Uh, but, and if there isn't, and if there is, I'm sure it's part of the Criterion Collection. <laughs> I hope so. I hope I'm you get to watch I the, com- the film convinced. version of Charlie Dane, uh, Charlie, yeah, Daniels, The Devil Went Down to Georgia. I'm like convinced that every movie is a part of the Criterion Collection. It's only got 600 movies in it, but I'm convinced that every movie is part of it. Well, yes. Until There's I'm proven wrong. story. Man versus nature, man versus himself. They're all the same thing. Right. Struggle. And every and every movie features a journey. Yeah. Internal or external. That's what this is. That's This movie is really just about the human condition. Right. Because, you know... Because <laughs> so everything's every other about movie. the human condition. That's, yeah. <laughs> Forget the podcast, Adam. What we need to do is make a movie that's not about the human condition. Um, it would have to be about an animal condition. Or just a rock. I think, uh... Yeah, it's just a picture of, like, a stick. Well, people, 
people have tried to make movies that aren't about human conditions because they're, they're not. Then the yeah, because they're not movies anymore. That's, that's I part. don't know. Okay, yes. we're off topic. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. Uh, what were we so, talking about? Oh, um, yeah, Seven Seal. Yeah, we're talking about Seven Seal. That's what pretty we're crazy doing. movie, huh? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. No, um, I I do want to talk the the scene of the ending of the chess match where the knight has decided that the thing he's going to do, his, his good deed, is to get the uh, actors uh, and, and the baby away. Yeah, most importantly the baby, I think. Yeah. You really... Yeah, now, maybe this is just because I'm a father, but you, I feel that, like... I felt that the knight, that Antonius, resonates with the baby most. That he has to yeah. try to save the life of this child. Yeah. No, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I, I wasn't sure if that was just me or the actual film. Yeah. So we get this scene, they're camped in the woods, uh, and it's after the witch is burned, and we kind of, we get this fade from the witch's fire to a cooking fire, and that's really disconcerting. <laughs> but, yes. Uh, Rommel arrives, and Rommel's the character who tried to rape the maid earlier, and then tried to... Uh, is also the one who Joff. convinced the knight to go out. Yeah, to and is also the... yeah, yeah. He's, he's the guy. He's the guy who, when he was part of the seminary, convinced the knight that he and the squire should go too. But basically, Rommel is is the source of all bad in the movie. Yeah, he um, is evil. He's the devil. He's probably the one who convinced the priest that that woman was the devil. Uh, was a was a uh, you know uh, witch too. You know, it wouldn't be surprising. The way this goes, it, yeah. the way this goes, it, I'm surprised it kind of wasn't explicitly stated. Um, so he's he's previously um, the squire has branded him a scoundrel by cutting his face, and now he is plague infected and runs up begging for water, and they don't help him. And of course, honestly, death. that was probably the hardest part for me, just because. Somehow, maybe because my brain wasn't working properly, I did not immediately pick up on the fact that he was plague-ridden. Oh. Possibly because of the way the time in this movie flows, it seems like he got the plague overnight and died from it overnight. Yeah. And you yeah, need a little bit more like time than that. And that's yeah, why well, I had trouble comprehending it. So. I feel like he says he has the plague. I don't remember explicitly. Maybe not. I may um, have just not been paying attention. It's but none the, none the fact they kind of let him die... Um, and he gets he gets his comeuppance there, I suppose, in that he's he's brought nothing but bad into the lives of the people he's now begging for help, and they don't help him. But, but and the as, thing is, there's nothing they can do for him anyway. Like, yeah, I mean, and there's the, nothing. The squire is not wrong. Yeah. It is useless. The man is clearly on yeah. his deathbed. Yeah, and it's interesting that the the person you know who the only person out the group who tries to help him is the mute maid who, you know, the last time they met, he tried, very clearly tried to rape her. Um, yeah, and it, it's weird also because, like, um, I guess I said, I have to amend what I said before, it is useless, so they can't save him, but they could show mercy. Yeah, yeah exactly. And give him a drink of water, but they don't. Yeah. Or, you know, even just show him mercy by killing him faster. Yeah, they get, there's a lot of things they could do that they don't do. Um, yeah, and it's interesting because of that. I think it's very interesting that as he dies, he's engulfed in this ray of sunshine. The sun has just risen. Yeah, and and death arrives with the sun as well, because death arrives because Ramos just died, but he died. He arrives to take the rest of them. Um, and he immediately, the first thing he does, sits down at the chessboard and takes the knight's queen. Um, which, you know, kind of this significance of all is lost. Um, and, uh, and Joff sees death at that point. And this is, this is one moment where we kind of have to know that, that Joff's visions are, at least this one is real. Because we know, obviously, that Block is really playing chess with death. I mean, as far as the narrative of the film goes. And Joff, Joff sees it, and he tries to tell his wife, and his wife doesn't believe him. And it's, it's kind of that commotion that convinces 
Antonius at last to, to save them more than anyone else. Um, so they have this conversation about escape, and, uh, and Death says, nothing escapes me, no one escapes me. And that's when the knight creates a diversion by accidentally knocking the board, knocking over pieces, and, and the family's given time to escape. And Death, it's kind of hinted that Death knows what's going on. Yeah, it's it's, since, you do get this kind of a little yeah. bit of a wink-wink, nudge-nudge that yeah. Death is letting this yeah. happen. Is he tells him he tells him that he'll be made in the next move, and he asks, you know, did you enjoy your reprieve? Because at this point, you know, the family's escaped. So the reprieve, it's not just that the game's over. You know, Block has achieved his goals as far as he's concerned. So the reprieve is over in, in more than one way, and Death knows that. And that, that's why I really feel like Death Death isn't after that family himself. Right, and then yet. you get into the fact that, like, you know, since Death is, in this movie, supposed to be purely a personification of a force. Yeah. He has it's no not... plans, he has no intentions. Those yeah. who die, die. Those who don't die, don't die. But everybody dies yeah. eventually. So he says, he's not wrong when he says, nobody escapes me. Yeah. But at and the it, same time... And it's, it's, it's meant to be menacing, yeah, obviously, just, from our point of view, but it's true. not, because it's just truth. And then, but they escape because they don't escape. Yeah. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? They, they escape yeah. this moment, but it's meaningless. Yeah, yeah. And and um, death, in the next few bits of conversation, it kind of gets into that. Uh, and Block asks him if he'll tell him their secrets. Death says, I have no secrets. He says, you know nothing? Death says, I have nothing to tell. Right, yeah, exactly, yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting thing because we don't often see death portrayed that way in the sort of fiction yeah. film, and it's it's actually really, <laughs> I want to say refreshing, but it's kind of funny because this is filmed as much older than most of the more modern renditions, yeah, yeah. but it is yeah, a refreshing exactly. take on an interpretation of death. The character well, is just it's, it's mostly thing. It's refreshing because... Death still wins. Is really yeah. He wins, but he wins. Yeah, it's refreshing because he wins, but he doesn't win because he's just a force. Yeah, Yeah, it was. It was never more than reprieve. It was never more than more time. Because he can't lose. (laughs) You know what I mean? Because yeah, Antonius Block is a human. He's a living thing, and so he must die. So there is no such thing as escape there's only reprieve and it, it it's i love that character he's my probably my favorite character he's certainly my yeah. favorite character in the film he's one of my favorite characters that we've seen so far is death yeah now he's 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 a great character he's, and that's i mean that's why it's a very memorable portrayal and that's why he shows up everywhere well, and it's it's weird too because like I but I've never seen this film before. We watched it for this, and the film, the cover of the film, and everything about it is just so menacing. Yes, to the point where I never really had any desire to watch the film. <laughs> and was not not necessarily not looking forward to it because I know of its reputation as a great film, but I was expecting this this very well. They're Northern European. You know, I was like, oh gosh, this is going to be the most depressing thing I've ever seen, but it's not. There's actually nothing depressing about this film. I mean, there are depressing moments, but the end result is not depressing. So. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. No, it. Yeah. I understand what you're trying to say. It's. Yeah, I'm not very clear. I'm tired, but. It's fine. I'm very tired myself, and that's one problem with this funk episode, is that we're both pretty tired right now. But I mean, I you know, I mean, maybe I wasn't as eloquent as I wanted to be. But my point is simply that the film creates an aura of an aura of sort of kind of this negative aura with the way it's shot sometimes. Mm-hmm. And stuff like it's very, no, yeah, but it's no, I not. I mean, like the film is more of a celebration yeah. of death? Yeah. Well, not not necessarily a celebration. I'm trying to figure out I mean, out some people are celebrating, it. but 
Yeah. But, it's but, just, but it's it's an acceptance of death. Yeah, that's what I meant to say. It's it's yeah. not. Yeah, no, it's certainly true. And the cinematography to that extent is is great. You know, it's it's menacing. It's menacing in its contrast, really. Um, I mean, like color, physically. Yeah, contrast. exactly. That's what I'm it's saying. It's everything. Is, on the film all the blacks are it. very black. The whites are very white. And Just looking at the very... film, you think, "Oh my goodness, this is going to be." Yeah, it's stark. Yeah, but it's not. Not really. Yeah. Basically, everybody nah. walks away happy in a, in a certain way. I mean, like, Antonius panics and starts praying for mercy at the end, but when he's in that chess game, he's triumphant. He's pleased with himself for having done this noble thing that he wanted to do, despite the fact that he didn't really do anything because death wasn't intending, wasn't ready for them yet so but it's almost like a thing that death just sort of gave him is like here you're triumphant <laughs> but... yeah it's weird that's how we're gonna end every <laughs> podcast it's just eh, it's weird eh, it's weird Stuff's let's shrug weird. and move on Thing, things are weird stuff happens this movie's weird well I it's very I, I understand why people stay up until four o'clock in the morning talking about it yeah <laughs> well hmm do you have any final thoughts Adam I don't I don't really nothing, do you have any more notes you want to talk about do you want to mention the fact Anyone? that the monk in the village looks like Mel Brooks oh the monk leading the uh, procession of uh, self flagigators yeah um, is is or themselves the trying to, to beg for God's forgiveness? Yeah, he does. He looks spitting image of Mel Brooks <laughs> to the point where, it, it really especially is. when you consider that there was a a movie called History of the World Part One in which he dresses as a monk. It's oh, it's too much. Yes, no, it's I understand. Um, but yeah. <laughs> do I have any on other that notes? note? No. I don't do you have anything else to say? No. I think we've made it through pretty much everything of mine. So, Seventh Seal, two thumbs up. What a weird way to end this. Good night. God yeah, bless. Good night. I think Pat and I are both going to bed now. Talk to you later. Okay, bye. <laughs>